Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm Lene Erickson. I'm a senior vice president at Third Way. Uh, and we are doing a series of great conversations in the lead up to the 2020 election to help us all understand better what is going on and, and how we can think about it. And uh, we have another great conversation for you today. Um, I feel like there's so much focus in the Democratic Party right now at the top of the ticket for understandable reasons. Um, but the crises that we're facing right now make it all the more evident how important it is who governs our states, who represents us in Congress, um, and makes those decisions that just impact Americans' everyday lives um, in, in time of crises and in normal times. So we have three people today with us who really helped create the blue wave in 2018 and are hoping to try to replicate it in 2020. And uh, they're really well equipped to help us think about all those many races that are going to be so important in addition to, of course, getting Donald Trump out of the White House. So with us today, we have Emily Kane, who is the executive director of Emily's List. She's a former elected official herself who has helped uh, thousands of women who want to run for office, probably tens of thousands at this point, um, and, and Emily's List candidates alone flipped enough seats to deliver Nancy Pelosi the gavel last time around. We've also got Wendy Wallace, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the Democratic Governors Association, um, which helped Democrats flip seven Republican held seats in 2018. And that was the biggest Democratic gubernatorial pickup in uh, 36 years also helped elect a record-setting six female Democratic governors who are now governing their states. I would say uh, I might be biased, but much better than their opponents would have in this moment of crisis. And finally, we have Le Leslie Martis, who is the Vice President of Political and Strategic Initiatives at the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee. And they also had a banner year in 2018. Um, and I would also say they reminded Democrats why we should care about state legislators, especially in advance of redistricting next year. So really uh, excited to have these three start the conversation. But I think with everything Americans are facing right now, I think we should start with governors. So we, we have seen such differences in how Democratic versus Republican governors have um, really run their states in this in this really difficult moment for people. Um, and I'm curious, Wendy, if you can talk a little bit about the landscape for those governor's races in 2020. What are we looking to? Are there places we think Democrats might be able to pick up? Or are there places that we really need to shore up uh, folks that might be having a tough race in this time? Sure. Thank you, Lene. Um, this is an amazing place to start, uh, even if, though I am biased. Um, and I just want to say thank you for having me um, for this conversation this afternoon. We're really excited to be here. Um, you know, I think the COVID-19 crisis has sort of shown a light on governors in a way that we we at the DGA had been hoping people would pay attention to governors uh, this much for a long time. We were not, this wasn't exactly what we had in mind. Um, obviously, I think, uh, so I think for people who are doing a great job, it is giving them a bump um, and people feel more endeared to their governors than they have in the past. Um, and so that's been great for people like Roy Cooper in North Carolina, who's up for reelection this year. Um, a state like North Carolina is always a fight, right? And there are so many things happening there electorally at every level. There's a huge election, you know, there's a Senate race, there's a governor's race, the presidential is gonna focus on it. They're, they're trying to um, flip state legislatures, which uh, Leslie can talk more about, but like, you know, state Supreme Court, they're doing it all, AGs, races, everything. Um, and so it's crowded and it's a fight and we are hopeful that some of um, what Governor Cooper's response has been to COVID-19 will resonate and stay with people through November. Um, we are going to do our best to hammer at home. I think in, uh, you know, just sticking with states that we're trying to hold, Montana is another big priority for us. Governor Bullock is termed out and running for Senate, as I think most people know. Um, Lieutenant Governor Cooney is really trying to pick up that mantle and, and run for governor this year. And I think 
also how people are thinking about what this crisis has looked like and what leadership has looked like in that moment will have an impact here. Um, for us on the pickup side, we are, oh, I, I, before I move to the pickups, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Governor Inslee in this moment, who really was on the forefront when everybody else was still kind of on the fence, you know, talking about should we wear masks, should we close the office, all of those things. Seattle and the state of Washington were really already very much in the throes of COVID relief and really leading on this issue. Um, and so we, we believe, and from what we are seeing right now, that is having a positive impact um, on Governor Inslee's race, but we obviously are keeping a very close eye on it and don't take anything for granted. Um, I think also what we've seen is, you know, our opponents have had differing uh, responses to it. It's not just all one broad brush. I think it has made the idea of flipping New Hampshire, frankly, a little bit harder than when we were originally coming into the year. Um, and it's made Missouri seem a little bit more attainable, right? We're, we're able to make a lot of differences about the way Governor Parsons is not <laughs> frankly, handling um, COVID-19 and, you know, moves to kick people off of Medicaid, children, like those are kinds of things that voters don't want to see or hear from their governors in a moment of crisis. And so it's been, um, it has been challenging. It has been harrowing and heartwarming to see our governors step up to the challenge in a big way. So. I'll, I'll leave it there. We can come back to it. <laughs> yeah. Emily, I mentioned that uh, I know Nancy Pelosi challenged you to give her the gavel uh, all by yourself, and you met that challenge. Not just you, of course, but everyone in Emily's list and, uh, and the fantastic candidates you recruited. Uh, but now these, these women who were elected in what could be called a year of the woman in 2018 have to get reelected, which is potentially a, a different argument, a different conversation. Um, I'm coming to you from just outside of Abigail Spamberger's district. I'm very aware of, uh, you know, what, what these folks are grappling with. And, and there's a lot to handle right now. And uh, they can't kind of run against DC necessarily in the same way that they were able to, um, you know, make that argument in 2018. So how are you all thinking about um, supporting those candidates that you help put in, in this position and, um, and then of course expanding their ranks? Well, it's, it's true. Emily's List of Women did deliver for Speaker Pelosi, uh, but the story of 2018 um, is started before 2018 and is continuing now. Because what we saw in 2018, we at Emily's List don't think of it as a wave. We think of it as a sea change. Because when you think about the seeds that were planted with you know, Hillary Clinton losing, Donald Trump winning, then Republican state legislatures across the country working to roll back worker protections, protections for women, health care access. What you saw is, is, is really what started then is continuing now. We see it in the numbers where, you know, post-2016, Emily's List has now had more than 55 thousand women sign up with us to say they want to make a plan to run for office. There were 32 yesterday. I get an email every day telling me. Um, but then when you think about the campaigns that won, when we won 34 seats, we flipped 24. Those, what, what those people had in common, um, well, the endless ones, they're all women, right? But the majority of the people who won House seats who were new members in 2018 were women. They were diverse. They were running unapologetically as themselves, right? They were running on who they are, what their family has been like, what their upbringing has been, what challenges they faced. Did they have a pre-existing condition? Did someone they love have a pre-existing condition? They ran on the things that their neighbors cared about. They really weren't focused on Donald Trump. That is what unites them. And that's why you find this so, so many different kinds of districts, whether you're talking about Kendra Horn in Oklahoma, or Abigail Spamberger in Virginia, Debbie Mukarsel Powell in Florida, Lauren Underwood in Illinois, Kim Schreier in Washington. These women could not be more different. Their districts are very different. What unites them is that they were running as, honestly, as themselves, right? They, they weren't running uh, with a message that was about one particular, um, you know, 
anti-Trump message. They were running on who they are, what they care about, and why they want to do this work. And that story, the reasons that they ran, are quite honestly more relevant today even than they were then, particularly healthcare. Right? When you think about healthcare, when you think about questions of justice right, and, and public safety, we, with, with Black, Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter protests going on around the country right now, what our women have been talking about, fair representation, access to the ballot, all of those topics from 2018 are carrying right through. We saw them carry us to wins in Virginia in the state legislature in 2019, flipping both of those chambers, working with our partners at the DLCC. We saw them win governor's races around the country in 2018, and we're gonna see that happen again. Donald Trump is still the president. Healthcare is still the most important thing on people's minds, except now, it's not just about how does it impact my family and my neighbors, it's actually about how does it impact my whole community as we look at a healthcare crisis and a pandemic. So I would say these women who, who ran as themselves now are, are running with an even greater conviction and sense of purpose, and I think that that, that combined with the strength of the technical strength of the campaigns that they're running will put them over the top again and add to their numbers in the fall. So Leslie, as somebody who works on social policy, you know, reproductive rights, LGBT rights, uh, immigration, uh, so many issues that are impacted primarily by the state legislatures. I've long been frustrated that Democrats don't seem to care about them as much as Republicans do, uh, at least until recently. So, you know, we saw for, for decades, Republicans put a lot of attention into flipping these, these, um, these chambers and then be able to get a lot of things done on guns, on, on reproductive rights, um, and, and just kind of tick through. So how have you all um, been able to galvanize Democrats' attention now? Um, and what is the pitch for 2020 when we have so many other races going on um, about why we really need to be focused on state legislatures and, and are there a couple states where we should hyper focus? Yeah, thanks so much for having me today. Um, so I think of, as you mentioned, like Republicans have really been focused on this. A decade ago, they launched Project Red Map with Carl Rove, went to donor to donor across the country and talked to donors about like what the simple things they could do if they took back legislatures. At the time, I was in North Carolina um, running the state house caucus there for the Democrats and experienced the onslaught of the money that flooded in. And one of my incumbent members up in Blowing Rock, North Carolina, Coley Tarleton, um, went to the mail um, to the post office, found all the opposition mail against him um, that people had thrown into the dumpsters or thrown in the trash and said, Leslie, there are 10 pieces of mail against me. I wouldn't even vote for myself based upon what I'm seeing here. They invested resources so heavily and we lost democratic legislatures across the country. And I think from then we saw like the impact that that could have, particularly in places like North Carolina, where we saw huge amounts of, of, of anti-progressive legislation passing through that legislature. That was shocking to a lot of folks, but we always knew um, that those folks existed on the other side. And then also we, they were preparing for redistricting and drew maps that would keep them in power in a lot of places over this past decade. Um, so I think as we look ahead, like what we want to highlight what Emily was just saying about um, in Virginia, what we also saw in 2017 in Virginia was that women and women of color won in districts that were surprised, that people thought that isn't the playbook, we need a different kind of candidate here, someone who looks different, but we won. And then in 2019, all of those folks were reelected. So we show that that playbook doesn't matter anymore and we need a new look for folks. We need to understand that they need to be authentic and real folks who are gonna to go to work. And then when we flipped the Virginia legislature, they went to work, passing the ERA, passing more protections than you can even believe for uh, many progressive issues. And I think that our allies in this space were really surprised by that and now suddenly think, wait, this is what can happen. Um, my first experience working for the state legislature was in 2006 for the Iowa Senate. And within a couple months of them flipping the legislature to Democrats, they increased the minimum wage in the state of Iowa. And I saw the amazing impact that it had. Um, and I think that's what folks are starting to tune in and see for themselves as they see positive stories and negative stories in states. Um, with COVID-19, the governors are leading, but in places where they have Republican-led legislatures, in places like Pennsylvania, where Democratic Governor Tom Wolf is in charge, the legislature tried to force the state to reopen um, and put people at risk. And so people are really starting to see the difference in their local governments, um, their state government, and in their governors in a real way. And I'll just flag as 
places to look at. Um, I think important places that we think we can flip, um, Minnesota would be possibly the place, the next place to create a Democratic trifecta. The Senate was not up in 2018, so has not been up since Donald Trump was elected. And we have the House and a, a Democratic governor in Tom Wall, um, Tim Walls. Um, and that's exciting a place and be the next trifecta. Also interesting is places like Arizona, where you're seeing a huge impact from COVID-19 happening right now. And we have the chance to take back that House and Senate um, and put some guardrails on that governor who refused to do anything to protect the people of Arizona. Um, and also places like Arizona, I mean, Pennsylvania, where we could flip the House and Senate uh, and give Governor Wolf more ability to pass progressive legislation in the state. So those are some exciting places. There's lots more to go with the state legislative world, 7,000 legislative seats across the country. But I do also wanna say that today, um, we flipped over 450 seats um, in state legislatures from red to blue since Trump's been elected at the DLCC. And we had another one today. We waited a week for results. Um, but in Kentucky, in Senate District 26, outside of Louisville, a district that Trump won by 10 points, Dr. Karen Byrd was just elected to Kentucky Senate. It's an exciting day for that. Um, she's an ER doctor, had to be uh, notified at the hospital because <laughs> she's very busy. But uh, it's a really exciting moment for us to say that like in a district that's a tough one, that Trump won, but Governor Bashir won, um, we can do great work. As a Minnesotan, I'm so excited to hear that <laughs> we're gonna focus on the trifecta there. That would yes. be pretty, pretty game changing in my home yeah. state, so yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but I also want to invite participants to uh, submit some questions you want these very smart women to answer. So in your Q&A box at the bottom, go ahead and start typing anytime. And in about five minutes, I'll start looking and, uh, and getting your questions into the mix. So you all work um, with candidates and uh, recruitment and trying to um, encourage the right people to run for office. Um, and also help them navigate difficult things. And we know that um, women in particular um, have different barriers that they have to get over. Voters uh, continue, at least some voters continue to see them differently, question their ability to, to lead or to govern. Um, how do you all, and I think I'll, um, I'll go to Emily first, but I'm sure Wendy, you have thoughts on this too, in terms of how it plays out in an executive office. How do you, help these women um, make the case, pre-butt sexist arguments or um, attacks that might come their way and rebut them um, in, in a, a time where we know that that is really still kind of bubbling under the surface and something we're all concerned about after 2016. Uh, thank you so much for this question, Lene. I do have strong feelings about this one. I As, thought you might. This is what we do at Emily's List 24 seven, right? So we need to start by saying, Sexism is real. Sexism is real everywhere, but it is especially alive and well when it comes to politics, um, Democratic and Republican politics. There, there are, can be worse maybe on the other side, but it is, is everywhere. And it is both overt and implied, right? And we see it whether it's, you know, Gretchen Whitmer gives her first State of the Union, one of the State of the State, and one of the first headlines that comes out was, what, you know, was her dress really the right fit for her? I mean, that really happened in 2019. Right? And we saw it with women running for president in the ways that they were asked questions. It was like the, the press treated them like they were in a separate lady primary, and maybe one of them could advance to the main stage with all the men. That, of course, is ridiculous, and those women proved all of them wrong when you ended up with so many of them on the stage right until the very end. So at Emily's List, I'll say what one major approach we have to this is winning. We win elections. We, we push the question, we spend money to elect women in primaries so that their names will be on the ballot in November. This is a very common thing. We end up, people will say, well, you know, why aren't there more women? I mean, why, and it, well, you have to have women's names on the ballot for women to win in November. It sounds silly, but it's true. And so at Emily's List, we go out and we recruit. We recruit hard, we recruit outside of usual suspects to try to find the best best pro-choice Democratic woman to represent those districts, whether they are state ledge districts, mayoral districts, Senate, House, governor, you name it, we're recruiting for it. Um, so, so that's one piece of it, right? You, you see winning matters because it changes who is on your screen when you turn on the news at night. Because of what we did in 2018, when you turn on any news channel about Congress, you are, unless they're just discussing like a Republican 
conservative caucus meeting, you will always see a woman and likely a woman of color in the image. That is amazing. That in and of itself changes aspirations overnight. If you are a young Native American girl and you turn on TV and you see Sharice Davids and Deb Holland, you know you belong there in the United States Congress, right? If you're a young black girl and you see Lauren Underwood, you know you have a spot in your government and your government needs you to be there, right? We have so many examples of the difference that having women in the image makes. But I wanna say something else about this before I turn it over to my colleagues. Whether we are talking about sexism or racism in politics, which our women deal with every single day, overtly and implied, we have to say it when we see it. We have to say it when we see it for them and with them. We have to have their back when they say it and we have to call it out when we see it as people who are on the inside and get to sit on this amazing balcony of our country and help impact who gets elected. We are all becoming more aware, particularly in this moment, of our own privilege. And part of having that privilege is speaking up and calling it out. And so at Emily's List, this is a role we've played for a long time and that we are going to continue to play when it comes to helping support our women and change the dynamic. It, because, you know, those women we elected in 2018, they, they didn't just get elected because they were nice and qualified, right? They, they got elected because we spent $46 million out of our independent expenditure to it, you know, <laughs> large chunks of that were spent to get them through primaries. It wasn't just because they were awesome. Right? So we have to not only do things about it to win the elections, but in our day-to-day -day work as operatives, as leaders, as political strategists, we have to call it out, name it, and change it if we're going to change it for the long run. Wendy, I want to let you weigh in here because, you know, y'all have recruited um, some fantastic new folks that are running. You helped, uh, you know, Governor Luham Grisham, Governor Kelly, Governor Mills, uh, Governor Whitmer, so many women uh, succeed in flipping seats last time around. Now we've got uh, Nicole Galloway running in Missouri. Um, what, what advice do you give these um, women that are running for governor about, about how to do it? And, um, and can you talk a little bit about you know, the Missouri race too to throw in some color? Sure. Um, well, for those of you who have not had the pleasure um, of meeting any of our incumbent women governors, let me tell you, they don't need a lot of encouragement from us. Um, and in fact, I feel like most of them, particularly the ones you were naming, like Governor Lujan Grisham or Governor Mills, are kind of people who feed off of that idea that someone is saying that they can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and they are very proud of having beat their opponents. I think, you know, Governor Whitmer, it was such a, a great story because she was in a contested primary and then comes out of it very strong and is able to beat um, her Republican opponent. And it, so I think one thing that um, we see and really try to encourage is making sure that the team around these candidates is right. And that's one of the things we've worked really hard um, on in Missouri is, you know, when we first started having conversations with Nicole, she want, like she understood and knew what she wanted and understood who she was coming into that race, who she was as the state auditor and wanted to run this race authentically and to be herself and to lean on her experience. Um, and she was like, I, I need to figure out like kind of what my team is going to be. And so we, our political director kind of worked with her, helped set up, um, you know, interviews and, and collected resumes and tried to find the right fit. Um, she is an amazing campaign manager, a person that we've worked with before and who has sort of been through it all before. Um, and I think we'll, that experience will be helpful but I also think for us, it is so important. Um, they, they always talk about the stat, Emily's List talks about the stat about how many times you have to ask a woman to run. Um, and again, we, when 
women are stepping up to run for governor, it's because they want to be governor. People don't run for it just kind of on a whim, like, oh, I think I'll try it. Um, but it is important to like authentically be who you are, show up as who you are, and have a team that supports you because people are going to throw out like, oh, well, is she really electable? That's my favorite one. It's like, electability is this catch-all that can mean anything from like, you have young kids at home and who will watch them if you're out being an amazing <laughs> like governor um, to like, well, like black women don't really run for that, you know, like, or, you know, you're single, how will you ever get married if you're out being an elected official? Like all of these things, whatever the thing is that people want to put up as a roadblock, they couch it all in electability. Um, and what our candidates and women governors that are, are showing is not only are, were they electable, but they are leaders. You know, when I see Gretchen Whitmer marching with protesters and visiting hospitals, and, you know, we're seeing all of our governors visiting hospitals, and they're like, you know, we're, we're doing it all. Um, and they have amazing teams who are helping them do that. So I, that, those are the things that we talk about. So I'm starting to see one some- One quick thing on the Nicole Gallagher. So okay. Nicole Galloway is one of these people, everyone on this call should find a way to meet Nicole Galloway virtually. She's amazing. She's the state auditor who won her election in 2018 by 12 points statewide as a Democrat in Missouri. Right? When other Democrats were not successful in 2018, she won her election by 12 points in 2018 there. She has taken, she has gone after with corruption charges, equally Democrats and Republicans. She has recovered millions upon millions of dollars from Missouri taxpayers, all while Governor Parsons has been failing with COVID. It is, it is a race that is, should not be underestimated this cycle. I, I just think, and again, this is an example of where it's a combination of who she is as, as a candidate, what kind of campaign she's running, and how awful her opponent is, combined with the context of the moment, I, I think this is really an exciting race. And I, just add it, I just want to add a bit of the, you know, Gretchen Whitmore was in the Michigan State Senate. Um, I just need to, like, focus on the point that, like, women are, like, as Winnie said, or and Emily said, but, like, the, the stats are true, that women are, have to be asked multiple times to run for office. I've had that experience when I ran the North Carolina House Caucus. Um, but once you get them into office, there are amazing amount of change that can happen. And then I think that we're also working to build the operation of their confidence to run multiple campaigns at larger scales. Um, and there's a lot of candidates, as you know, in Congress now, um, governors and running for U.S. Senate and maybe in the state of Maine, uh, who are in <laughs> important people in the legislatures. Uh, so just want to like how important that piece of it is. Um, that I think that women don't necessarily feel like they can just descend to running for governor. They oftentimes feel like they need to be a part of different parts of, lo of local government at different levels. And I think we need to change that, but I also want to acknowledge that that's an important piece. Yeah. So Leslie, the first question from the participants is actually for you about Ooh. Texas. So, oh, goodness. Uh, you know, I think uh, speaking of places that have been hard for Democrats his historically, that's certainly one of them. Uh, that one of our participants wants to know, could you comment on the possibility of Democrats retaking the Texas House? I think we only need 10 seats, maybe 11 to retake the majority. Can you talk about that? And, and I would broaden it just the, the South more generally. And, you know, are there, are there other places where um, we might be able to flip or, or break a, a supermajority or something else exciting? Yeah, yeah. So the Texas House is really incredibly exciting because of what the changes that are happening there. And then it's also a story about 2018, um, where we picked up a lot of seats there. Um, and so that really has put us in the position where we just need these 10 seats in the Texas House um, to take the majority. Uh, I think we're really excited about it. And if you look at like what has happened, I think in uh, what we saw in 2018, and we're still seeing as a continuation of it, it's these suburban seats. And Texas is about outside of Dallas, outside of Houston, um, that have a lot of actual overlap with congressional districts as well. Um, so we think that there's a lot of energy and a lot of potential there. Um, I will say that like Texas is an expensive state. Those campaigns are, are very expensive. They're big districts. Um, whenever our data people have pulled <laughs> lists for Texas, we always, we always compare it to other states and say, wow, this could be like a congressional district. Um, so they're not, is a, they're not 
the budgets are large and it will take a lot of investment for folks on this call, folks you know across the country to really pull it off. But what a big deal that would be. Um, I'll also mention that there's 15 seats, um, the Beto one, that we think are really good targets. So the map exists there and there's the opportunity. Um, and we'll know more in the next coming weeks. Other states, um, Georgia is a really interesting, um, looking at the state house there, they need 16 seats. Uh, we think that there's a lot of energy um, and definitely want to see what happens there. Um, it's definitely on our list. The Florida house as well. Um, we think that there's some amazing opportunities to go there. And then, of course, go in North Carolina. Um, I would love, love, love to deliver one of those legislatures for the wonderful Governor Roy Cooper. Um, I'm partial to the House, but we'll take the Senate, whatever we can do, um, to ensure because Governor Roy Cooper won't have veto power over maps in redistricting. So it's critical that we get one of those chambers back. Um, and I think that they have continued to chip away um, at the Republicans there and picked up more seats, and I think they're primed to do it there. So, uh, Emily, someone asked a question that I know is going to um, make you uh, go into a, a little spiral of doom, but okay. I'm going okay. to rephrase it, oh, wow. uh, okay. it, it in a way that, that makes it helpful. So, uh, we uh, folks are wondering, you know, basically what would you say to voters that argue the Trump presidency made women less electable? Um, or proved that they're not in fact electable to go back to our, our point. Um, but, uh, but I'll kind of frame this with some of our research. You know that we, we've done some research about electability and what people think it means. Um, and one of the frustrating things was we saw um, you know, that, that people brought up gender and race as, as things that made people less electable, um, being a person of color, being a woman, um, they would say, maybe I'll vote for that person, but I'm not sure someone else will vote for that person. And uh, more often than not, it was women saying that about other women, which adds to the frustration. So um, when we are all talking to those voters, <laughs> what is our best kind of elevator pitch to persuade them that that's not true? I'm sure we all have our own favorite talking points, but this is your bread and butter. So, so let me start with, I actually reject the premise of the question to some extent. Not, I know you're not shocked by that, about Trump making women less electable. The, 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 the numbers about that don't bear that out. Now, Emily's List turned 35 this year, which means we are old enough to run for president. Obviously, that's not happening this year, but we fully intend to break that penultimate glass ceiling of vice president. And I think it's important, if, as we think about this, to think about what happened in the 2020 presidential primary. Because what we saw happen is that we saw, we, we learned a lesson as a country, which is that all women are not the same. And I know that sounds a little silly, but it, it, it matters as we think about both women candidates and women voters. Women candidates are not all the same, and women voters are not all the same. And what we saw on display in the presidential election, particularly with the four women senators who were running, they were all running with the same values, with different, slightly different platforms, different priority sets, different approaches, different experience sets, and they didn't all look the same. Right? And, and that matters because when we think about what has happened since 2016 and this impact of Donald Trump, where we saw millions of women and men alongside them march post Donald Trump's election, I told you about the 55,000 plus women who are continuing to sign up to, to, to run for office. The, the sea change moment of 2018, which put more women in office really than ever before, and also has an even bigger wave coming behind it in that next round uh, with, with Leslie and the state legislative chapter, state legislative chambers that are all around the country. Um, so I actually think in 2020, we took a major step forward for women in politics because we saw all of those women compete at such a high level in the presidential. That was not a step backwards. We've only ever had one woman run for president who was Emily's List endorsed, I should say, in our 35 years, and we endorsed her both times. Um, but now we see that multiple women can, can do that. And I think there's going to be a key moment here coming post-2020, because I do believe Joe Biden can win. And I believe Joe Biden will treat and this VP, this woman VP, whoever she is, and no, I don't know, nor do I know exactly when it's gonna be, because I know you're gonna ask me that. Um, but he's gonna treat her as a partner in governance. And we know that because that was his experience as vice president. 
with President Obama. So I think we are headed in the right direction. I think we're overall, this has been a positive thing for women in 2020. But I want to say another piece about women voters. Women voters are also not all the same, right? Despite being lumped in and whether we're talking about white women versus black women versus Latinas, whether we're talking about suburban or exurban or rural. Um, but when we see what the issues are that do unite them, we certainly see healthcare, though it may play out differently in each of their own lives. But when we see who shows up to vote is where I've been focused. And when Emily has listed our, our research in post-2018, what we found in our battleground states is that the turnout was 54% women. And 54% women, if we can get to 54% women this year in 2020, I believe we win. We win a lot of things. We, we may even win all the things. And, and that is because where we see what, what united these women were, they supported women candidates. They did. They, they came out for issues of health care. They, 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 it really wasn't about Donald Trump. It was about all the other stuff. And that's why the quality of the candidates matter. It's why we have to get past this electability garbage. Electability simply means someone who isn't like who I've known to be elected before. Remember when Barack Obama was unelectable? Remember when Donald Trump was unelectable, friends? Um, women are not unelectable. You just have to vote for them. And I think that's our opportunity as a, an organization who supports women running for office and partners with organizations like the DGA and DLCC to position the women to be the best possible candidates to, to, to run, win, and then lead and govern. Um, we, we're going to continue to make that case. And I think we've, we've actually taken leaps and bounds ahead since Donald Trump, though I will not give him credit for So uh, we, we've talked a lot in the past, you know, 18 months, two years about the impact of black women in particular in the Democratic Party and, and how they've been uh, perhaps taken for granted in the past, uh, assumed that they'd just be there. And then we saw um, them really show up and deliver in a lot of tough races in, in uh, 17, 18, 19. Um, how are you all in your respective roles thinking about um, engaging Black women, Black communities in general, and making sure that your candidates are um, really appealing to the full range of voters that they need to uh, put together a winning coalition. Sorry, I was trying to find the unmute. Um, yes, Black women have saved the Democratic Party for many elections, um, and just want to acknowledge that from the start. And I think it's like, very exciting, like some of our candidates that we have, particularly places like Flagstaff, Arizona, the mayor is running for the state Senate there. Um, there's amazing opportunities. And I also want to say about state legislatures that it's not just about winning these elections, it's about creating power. And they may not be in a competitive district, but we want them to be chair people of important committees in their state legislatures that will drive legislation that will happen. Um, so I think it's like, we focus, of course, on flipping those legislatures with important seats, but we're also thinking about who are the leaders going to be um, that will help make some of those decisions because people who've worked in state legislatures really get how important having those proper committees and the proper chairperson for the committee makes a difference. Um, as you know, our, our chairwoman, um, Andrea Stewart Cousins, the Senate Majority Leader um, of New York, <laughs> always says, as a, you know, up in Albany, you know, it's about those people who are in charge and the leaders, and that's who's going to make a difference. Um, so we think a lot about how we can elect those candidates and also think about in districts as well, like in places like some places like in Virginia, where it's not majority people of color districts, but that women of color and particularly black women can lead those districts. Um, we want to kind of break the mold of that. We've seen some of that in Virginia and we think we can see some of that in places like Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, and we think that that's a really important piece to say that uh, the black women have helped our, our party so much and we have the obligation to, to lift that up and make them leaders um, in our legislatures. Wendy or Emily, do you want to add anything to that? So I'll add a couple of things. One is, one of the things that I try to stress all the time is that the past is not prologue. Um, particularly in this area, I think people treat black voters and particularly black women voters because they have been savior, we have been saviors of the party for so long. Um, like, oh, we just have to remind them to vote, they will turn out, like, and it is taken, those votes are taken for granted. I think um, there, there has been a very long time where that was true. Um, 
fortunately or unfortunately, I think, you know, between like the civil rights era and like the early 2000s, with a lot of kind of middle age black voters who kind of came of age during that civil rights time, like my parents' age. Um, I will say I am, I'm 38 years old. I do not like to be treated that way. And I am in a, as Emily mentioned before, I'm in a very privileged position where I get to sit with these people and ask some questions. And so when people ask me, when my friends ask, who are not in politics ask me what I think of a person or they say they sort of like a person, I say, are you sure? Cause I don't really know. Um, and people younger than me, these people that you see out in the streets with the Black Lives Matter protest, are much more intent on the need to earn their votes. And so what I try to stress with candidates is, regardless of the community, you need to go there. You are running to govern all the people. You need to sit down with Latino voters. You need to sit down with Black voters. You need to sit down with younger voters, older voters. Like, you have all this time to run for this office use it wisely like right you can't be everywhere you can't speak to every person but you need to figure out how to use your resources the most wisely so you're reaching the most people um, and they hear your message directly from you and i do think that that has a big impact in the same way that demographics have changed before they will change again and demographics are not destiny and so you shouldn't ever ever take those votes for granted the only thing I'll add to that is, is we need to elect black women. And in order to do that, we need to recruit black women. We need to support black women. We need to train black women. And most of all, we need to listen to black women, right? This, this is not, um, again, as I said earlier, you don't win an election just because you're super nice, right? Or actually you don't even, you don't win because you're the smartest, right? You, it actually takes people supporting you, taking you seriously, giving you, giving you that chance. And I would actually say, you know, having you take that chance. And so that's why at Emily's List, we're very focused at all levels of, of government, right? Our work at the state and local level in particular, building out pipelines, as we think ahead to things like redistricting, right? We need diverse voices from women leaders on redistricting committees if we're going to get maps that actually reflect America, fair maps, right? We need more black women in office who can be a part of those conversations if we're going to avoid a gerrymandered disaster across the country like we had after 2010. So it comes back to this question of who is in office actually matters. So we do need to elect, recruit, support, train, fund, and listen to Black women if we're gonna change that. And I think the, the interesting moment we're in now um, is, is there are so many Black women who are stepping up to lead right now today. You don't have to wait and go look around, right? You can support state legislators like Sydney Batch in North Carolina and Amelia Sykes in Ohio. You can support candidates for office like Joyce Elliott running in Arkansas or Jackie Gordon running in New York or Desiree Timms running in Ohio. You can support members of Congress like Johanna Hayes in Connecticut, Lucy McBath in Georgia, Lauren Underwood, who I mentioned earlier. There are no shortage of black women for whom right now you can take an action. Right, and I think for us at Emily's List, that's why we've been doing so much work to uplift the black women who we're supporting around the country uh, right now, but before now, and we'll continue to after, and why we partner with other organizations like Higher Heights and The Collective, who do specific work inside the black community to uplift black leaders. And at Emily's List, we work to, we work to with, them, with as many women as possible, um, but particularly, we are focused on making that kind of change, because that is what, that's who we are as a country. Right, it, it is not just about, I think what Wendy said is true, it's not just about the history of black women being the bedrock of the Democratic Party, it's about us as the Democratic Party stopping, listening, and then taking an action to help and support the black women who are already leading, we just now need to put them in office. So we're unfortunately coming very close to being out of time, which is very sad to me because I could talk to you guys all day long. Uh, but Leslie, I'm going to give the last question to you, um, which is, you know, a lot of folks in, in D.C. 
um, or even you know in states they're they know how to uh, support Joe Biden they'll give give him money they know how to support um, their their governor or gubernatorial candidate um, they can certainly support the BGA or Emily's list um, but some of them uh, might not know how to engage with state legislatures and support those candidates because there's so many and um, it's just not something that they've spent as much time thinking about. So if you are a person that in your state or um, in general wants to get involved to help uh, flip state legislatures to help uh, really grow those leaders that you're talking about, how, how can you do that? So my finance team, if they're listening, and it's the close of the quarter, so I've got to say TLCC.org is a great place to start. You can make a contribution. It's the last day of the quarter. You could use it. Um, it goes to support um, all these state legislative races. I also would say if people are looking for individual candidates on our website, we also spotlight candidates. Um, we have a, a we put up candidates in pet races, interesting stories, and provide links. I think it is the biggest challenge. Um, I mean, like you know, like you think about it, like federal races have always thought of like chess, like there's movement and there's like you know where you're going. And then state legislatures are like whack-a-mole. There's opportunities everywhere. Um, and so we use our website as a place to kind of drive attention to certain races that need resources um, and will be the game changers of it. So definitely visit dlcc.org. Finance team, if you're listening, I did my job. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure that uh, both the DGA and Emily's list could also use the end of the quarter donation. So. Yes. We're happy to do that. Or actually, I would say go to emilyslist.org, click on candidates, click select all, put in the largest number possible, the largest number possible, and we will evenly distribute your contribution between all of our endorsed candidates. And we, we don't, you know, there's no, they get 100% of it. So yes, there's lots of ways, lots of active action yes. items after today. I love it, I love a to-do list. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. I have to say, uh, if these three women are the ones that are at the helm of whether we have another blue wave in 2020, I'm feeling very good about our prospects. So thanks for joining me and we'll have you back to celebrate all of our victories after the election. Thanks so much. Thank you for all so much. Bye.